Welcome to the church. Thank you for being back. Thank you for being our community. Thank you for being our reason to be here. Um, I am very pleased to introduce, not Scott Chasky, um, but our dear friend, Catherine Soka, who will introduce Scott Chasky. Scott Chasky, I'm Sherry Pascarelli, the executive director of the church. Sorry, I forgot to say that. And this is our dear friend, Catherine Soka from Canios Books. Hi, Scott. It's wonderful to see you, and it's wonderful to be here. And thank you, Sherry, and thank you to Lena and April and the church. Uh, Marianne and I are indebted to your support for Canio's books, and we welcome everybody to come to the store and see how, uh, why they like us to come here and support them. So tonight I'm really uh, honored to introduce Scott Chasky to you. Um, a lot, number of you already know Scott. Um, just a few words about his books. Uh, Scott has previously published Stars Are Sons with Stoneman Press, beautiful poetry book. Also prose books, the common, This Common Ground by Viking and Sea Time by Rodale. But tonight we're here to celebrate soil and spirit, cultivation and kinship in the web of life by Milkweed Press, which is really an honor of, of, in, in both directions with the press and for Scott himself, uh, great press. And his agent, Paul Bresnik, is here, who has helped shepherd Scott through his career. Uh, the book is part memoir, it's part life guide in the form of essays. Uh, Scott reflects in different, chap in different uh, essays on previous chapters in his life going back to Maine, going to the Cornwall coast in England, New Mexico, and other locations. As many of us know, um, Scott is a farmer, a brilliant writer, a poet, uh, a CSA pioneer, and, and a friend. Um, for over 30 years, he directed Quail Hill Farm, which was the first CSA in New York State, which is an amazing, <laughs> yes, applause, applause. He is the past president of the Northeast um, Organic Farming Association. He was the Farmer of the Year in 2013, and I'm not sure why you weren't other years too, but we'll take one, because that's part of Scott's great attributes. He's humble and he likes to share, so other farmers got that acknowledgement. Uh, and he's a founding board member of the Center for Whole Communities in Vermont. But beyond the titles and the awards, um, Scott is thoughtful, He's reflective, he's a creative thinker, an excellent listener, and a very kind person. He's down to earth with deep connections in the earth to what's both below the ground, above in the sky, and to what grows uh, and walks on the surface. So before everyone was talking about interconnectedness and the wood wide web, uh, Scott was actually living it. Uh, on a personal note, in 2006, I documented Quail Hill Farm photographically with my essay, Through the Seasons on Quail Hill Farm. Uh, I traveled there every week from the first planting of seeds in a snowy April, as I recall, to the last winter harvest uh, and beyond. And what began in my mind as a study of the landscape quickly developed into a study of relationships, uh, the farm workers with each other, uh, the farm workers in Scott with the land that they nurtured and the CSA members that they helped on Quail Hill Farm. In other words, the story was about how everything is connected to everything. And at the hub of that was Scott, who really epitomizes the servant leader. It, he is the best of all possible teachers. He's always doing and not telling. He's always encouraging by suggestion or by inquiry like a late spring day when he said, I'm going to plant some spinach. It's about the smallest seed that you can plant with our mechanical planter. Want to come? So off we went, and I got a great lesson on planting and some great photographs because it was late in the day, and the warm spring light you know, glowed beautifully in the field. So add to all of those things, to, to Scott's talents, an abundant amount of energy because after spending those long days outdoors, he then came in and spent early evenings in his beech tree house, 
carving, whittling out words on his desktop computer that was layered from lots of dirt out in the field. Uh, so he, it was a cozy, intimate space where he worked, a sort of a nest to nurture his creative mind, which is obviously abundant. So add also resilience. Farming makes one humble. Um, an abundant harvest is never guaranteed. The unexpected always happens, and it's not always good news. But Scott would go onward through the good and the not so good, like the pandemic where plans were dashed, but Scott pivoted and wrote Soil and Spirit for all of us to enjoy. So I'd like to close by reading a quote from the book by the writer Gary Paul Nahab. As one of America's greatest agrarian poets and essayists, Scott Chasky deserves recognition as a national treasure. He both expands our horizons and deepens our contemplative capacities with the astonishing connections he makes between soil, soul, and sustenance in these changing and in these challenging and eloquent essays. Soil and spirit will be read and reread for many years to come. And you can start tonight by getting yours at the back. But anyway, please give a very warm hometown welcome to Scott Chasky. Well, thank, thank you. Um, this is working, that's good. So Catherine, I'm gonna have to call you back after that most wonderful introduction, but you have to bring my book because it has my markers and I'm gonna give you your book. <laughs> oh, thank you, Catherine, that was really lovely. And thank you all for being here. I'm gonna start with a poem. A breath, meadow man, house scholar. From field to chair, I hear the deep choir of the anvil, iron and rust, irony, dust. Then Nordic beat breaks to summer, willows wave, elderberry beads gift the cloud. Dog rose shades the shore. In a measure of rage, I know the weightlessness of innocence. At dawn, silken nursery tents spin the field to song. Sea air, violet, betony stare, shake the man to make of breath a mortal joy. So the, um, uh, the book starts with a, I, I'm so thankful to Milkweed and, and to, um, Daniel Slager, who's the CEO of Milkweed. Um, it, it's, it's just been a, a beautiful experience to work with them. And, and it was Daniel's suggestion that this book of prose start with a poem and end with a poem. So that's the poem that, that begins it. Um, thank you to the church for having me. It's just lovely to be in this space. I've just come back from Minneapolis, which is the home of Milkweed. I, I was there from Thursday through Sunday. And I'm just so impressed with them and what they do and their mission. And um, the connection actually is about as natural as you could get because um, when I first had my conversation with, with Daniel when he was thinking about, about the book, um, I said, well, do you know um, my book Seed Time, the one that came before this? And he did not. And I said, well, guess what's on the cover? A milkweed seed. Um, and he wasn't, he wasn't even aware of that, actually. Um, and I'm going to read one little, one little um, passage from one of Milkweed's books, a beautiful book that I was given when I was there. It's called When the Whales Leave. Um, and, and, and Daniel started a, a series called the Seed Bank Series. So uh, again, our connection um, is, is an organic connection. Just as repositories around the world gather seeds in an effort to ensure biodiversity in the future, Seed Bank gathers works of literature from around the world that foster reflection on the relationship of human beings with place and the natural world. So um, that's what my book is about, basically. Um, I, I, Luckily, have never been able to come up with the elevator speech, but there, you know, that's good enough right there. 
Um, so the last book, Seed Time, I want to read a, a beautiful passage from John Hay, one of, one of the great writers of nature that, that has existed anywhere. Um, I hope some of you know him or, or find him. John Hay wrote this, and this really ended my book, Seed Time, and it begins this book. To what useful end could I use my eyes without acknowledging that they are only one of the Earth's inexhaustible ways of seeing? So that really is what, that's, that's the thought that, that begins this book. So, so now I'm going to read you some bits, some passages. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because this is a, a book of interconnected essays, and you would think, well, I could just pick this part or that part, but it really is interconnected. And um, so when I read the, these passages, some of the, you're going to miss some of those because, because they, one thing leaps into another. So I don't know, do you think we have enough time I could read the whole book? or <laughs> Maybe not. So I'm going to read some passages, maybe some of the sort of lyrical ones. And um, it covers a lot of ground, literally, uh, from here, the ground in Amagansett, to uh, a garden in Maine where I first learned to garden and first learned um, about the beauty of trees. And then to Cornwall, where we lived for 10 years, and to China, to a trip to China. So there's a lot of, lot of ground covered. Anyhow, I'm going to start with the prologue, which is called A Golden-Fledged Growth. In the forest of Arden, Shakespeare's Orlando hangs pages of odes on trees, a poetic variation on the signals that trees exchange underground through fungal hyphae and mycorrhizal social networks. Orlando's intention is romantic, that of the woodland plants, though we cannot be certain, less so, if equally ardent. We do know that we share with plants the same need and impulse to communicate, and recently we have been reawakened to our evolutionary friendship with other species and to what Mary Evelyn Tucker calls the ever-expanding dynamic circles of connectivity. Stories are born when people come together in relationship, and stories connect us with other species that share our soils, our air, and our water. The challenges that confront us daily in the 21st century, familial, social, economic, political, environmental, can be overwhelming. And as we encounter what is reported as the greatest challenge humanity has collectively faced, climate disruption, the term Ralph Nader prefers, as do I. It is timely to revisit an ancient theme, an interspecies theme, our kinship with nature. In his wise and playful book, Mesquite, my friend Gary Paul Nabon, ethnobotanist and Franciscan brother, introduces the Mexican rancher Ivan Aguirre, who says, part of our role here on this planet is to generate riqueza, how would you best say it in English? Richness, abundance, diversity? We are put here to observe the natural world and learn from its structure and its vigor. Traditionally, in multiple cultures, academies of learning have been cited within a natural structure, a forest grove or arbor. In Ireland's ancient Brahan law, a code of conduct, forest protection was of vital importance. Irish hedge schools were often situated in fields and hedgerows within a grove of trees. The prolific 20th century Indian writer and respected educator Rabindranath Tagore held classes under a canopy of leaves and branches. Of your two teachers, he advised, you will gain more wisdom from the trees. My education most closely resembles an earthen fabric woven together throughout decades of daily attention to soil structure, both loam and mycelium, and as a curious traveler exposed to diverse landscapes. I have learned through literature and in friendship with land. My teachers, poets, pine, oak, beech, stone, silt loam, the sharp-shinned hawk, and the windhover. Years ago, I built a home on a steep hillside above the Cornish village of Mausel, that's spelled mouse hole, by the way, 
Megan and I lived in Love Lane Cottage Mousehole, <laughs> where I lived with my wife and first son for a decade. In a village built almost entirely of stone, originally of granite and slate and later concrete block, with a harbor wall dating from 1392, our house made of wood was an anomaly. I didn't have a clue how to build with stone, though eventually, out of necessity, I would dabble in the art of stone hedging, a common practice in a landscape of abundant granite and slate, so timber was the material of choice. After deconstructing, carefully, a homely pre-World War II bungalow made entirely of asbestos, we raised our timber framing on the original foundation, repairing and replacing blocks where needed, and we left the heart of the home the hearth and chimney intact, for a time open to the sky. Often at a loss of how to proceed, I was saved in countless days by the intuition, strength, and practical skills of my woodworking mate, Peter Perry, a member of the Men of the Trees. Our labor with saws, chisels, and hammers was timed to the calls of jackdaws and gulls and to the surge of the sea on granite just below and the strong, straight flight of the shag a cormorant, as she skimmed across the surface of the bay, I perceived a way to act and to build day by day. So I'm going to skip a bit here. Throughout 30 years of farming on the South Fork of Long Island, New York, my travels have led me to return to the rugged Cornish Penwith Peninsula where I first learned to cultivate plants, to a pueblo in New Mexico, to the southern coast of Maine, to an international gathering of community farming activists in China, and in memory to the west coast of Ireland. The thread that binds the story I have to tell is linked to an aspect of the mythic tale of the golden bough. This golden fledged growth, a scion of an oak, serves as talisman and key for the journey. Should the traveler be allowed to free a branch from the tree, another golden bough will sprout in its place, and thus another traveler will chance to pluck a living symbol of our symbiotic relationship with fecund, numinous, endangered nature. This book, through stories of people, plants, and place, explores that relationship. The Japanese poet Matsuo Basho, known as Nature's Pilgrim, saw in the movements of sun and moon across the sky a metaphor for a journey. Years coming or going, wanderers too, each day is a journey, and the journey itself home. We ourselves are whirling day by day within circles of connectivity. What you will read in this book is the pulse of the bow when plucked, the pulse of the poems within the wall, the beat of the cormorant's wings in flight just above the sea's surface, the salt spray tossing to touch the bird's wings, all part of the miraculous that comes so close, wild in our breast for centuries. So that's the, that's the beginning of the book. And um, I, I left out, I, because I skipped, I left out the, uh, the poems in the wall, so I'll tell you about that. Um, so there is, a, there is a part in one of the chapters where I'm helping to rebuild an old farmhouse in Maine I was in my 20s, and um, the, the fellow who owned it um, uh, said he had always heard um, that when you're taking apart the old walls, take a look, and you're probably going to find a coin that was placed there by the builders, and then you know when the, the date of when the house was built. And we found it, and uh, it was 1811, actually. And that was a thrilling moment. I mean, he almost jumped through the roof when he found that. So when I was building this, um, the, the studio house in Cornwall, um, instead of a coin, I, I put poems in the wall before we put the wall up. So they're still speaking, I hope, from, the, from, that, from those walls. OK, so um, now I'm going to go to. I'm going to move to Cornwall now. I'll see if I can touch on, on some of the different places here. Each chapter um, begins with um, an epigraph or two, and this one is called, this is called Older Than Thought. 
The hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind, my heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. Do we have any Gerard Manley Hopkins um, fans here? That's, there we have one. And uh, the second one is from a wonderful Scottish poet named Hugh McDermid. I am no more indifferent or ill-disposed to life than death is. I would fain accept it all completely as the soil does. I must begin with these stones as the world began. Known in England warily by some as the West Country and as Balerian by the Romans, Cornwall is a place where the old friendship of stone and man is palpable, visible everywhere. The most visible stone, sometimes labeled as Cyclopean, is granite, and much of the rugged coastline is defined by outcroppings of it and by the caves carved into it by the surging sea. This rock, in a molten state, welled up in the Carboniferous period, and the face of the rock, large crystals of quartz, feldspar, and mica, became exposed over centuries. Slates and shales known locally as Killis a product of the early Devonian period, add variety to the flow of the land, and a subvolcanic rock with a handsome name, Blue Elven, surfaces along the coast between the bold granite sculptures. The interaction between these various rocks led to the formation of metalliferous ore deposits, copper and tin, among others, and thus Cornwall, thousands of years ago, became known as a source of metals, whether this is factual or not, when walking above the strong sea on the dramatic coast path, it is fanciful to imagine Phoenician merchants in search of tin guiding their primitive crafts toward the rocky coast of Cornwall over 3,000 years ago. So they supposedly traded saffron for tin. Long way to come, 3,000 miles for that tin. The surrealist painter and writer, Ithel Calhoun, issued a warning. West Penwith is granite, one of the oldest rocks, a byword for hardness, endurance, inflexibility. That is the fundamental fact about Cornwall's westernmost hundred. And unless you like granite, you will not find happiness there. It's true. Um, luckily, we found some happiness there. But we also learned how hard granite is. That same granite, hauled, piled, and artfully placed to build stone walls, has long served as a kind of terracing on the steep and uneven terrain, so the land could be transformed into individual meadows to be worked by hardy, adept gardeners with mountain goat pedigree. Throughout the co county, the old trackways, often wide enough for only one vehicle, are lined with stone walls, some stacked so high as to create a tunnel effect. The surfaces of these stone hedges are made up of riotous vines and greenery, but the plant life only obscures the careful stone hedging that serves as fencing for the patchwork of farm fields. The prominent standing stones that appear everywhere, menhirs, quoits, which are chamber tombs, stone circles in greater concentration than anywhere else in the British Isles, reflect the strong character of the place and add more than a bit of mystery. Calhoun refers to these keepers of ancient power as the living stones. Her book of that title, first published in 1957, begins with an epigram from the Song of Amergen, and Amergen is, is thought to be the first poet of Ireland. Who but I can unfold the secrets of the unhuman, unhewn dolmen? That's, that's from the Song of Amergen. The words of the New Hampshire author, Howard Mansfield, read as a kind of echo of the landscape of Cornwall. In ancient belief, stones were the bones of the earth. Stones were animate. We are, at heart, ancients. So I'm going to move on to further in that chapter. Uh, still, still in Penwith. So Penwith is the um, far southwest peninsula of Cornwall, uh, and, and it's not on the way to anywhere, so you have to want to go to Cornwall um, to, to get there. Five and a half hours by fast train from, from London. 
Soon after my introduction to the Penwith Peninsula, rising daily to the first light that rides the water of Mounts Bay, I wrote the following poem, Aria in Sea. Our hillside cottage faced east toward the Lizard Peninsula, which is the farthest southern point of, of England, the Lizard, which is eight degrees further north than here, which is an interesting fact because there are literally um, no seasons there. Well, actually, Megan named the seasons uh, rip, pre-rip, rip, and post-rip. Those are the seasons. That's the wind in Cornwall. Late winter wet on privet hedge and fuchsia's red, the dressed white of cove wind. East wind stirs fabric among stones, clothes woven by cliff stream and cold. My eye records diffuse and difficult tones, sea chants and chance bucklings of branch and cone, self shimmer of earth change. List, list, here within range of touch, sense and sounds I am other to resist. Luke notes of moorland ease with night shadow into morning and unearth a music that gentle light gives to eyes in a play of days. Not far from our solid wooden door inscribed with the name Love Lane Studio, which opened to a steep path leading up to the lane, the southwest coast path continues on its meandering way westward towards land end. From there, it rounds the promontory to hug the Atlantic coast, heading up country toward Devonshire. On the way to the coast path, 50 steps from the gravel entrance to Love Lane, a thick tangle of brambles disguise the gateway to the ancient cliff meadows, my daily destination. There, shovel, seeds, and chipper in hand, I would descend through a series of steep meadows to the chosen patch to enact a ritual practiced by villagers over hundreds of years. It was there I learned to garden in the quilt of small meadows lined with stone and profuse greenery. James Joyce spoke of the druid silence of the sea in another Celtic place, and though the legacy of druids lingers in the air and thickets of Penwith, it is more common for the sea to speak or shout with tidal abandon. Wave sound echoes back and forth from Merlin's Rock just off the coast to Mausel Cave a whistle away. The meadows I tealed, the word used for tilled there, the, wet, the meadows I tealed and planted potatoes in were a kind of fertile crust over the cave below, a granite mouth of the headland, hollowed out over centuries by the gales pounding in from the southwest. After clearing brush or spading by hand, I would scramble up the stone steps, and if the day was fair, I would walk out to the west to follow the coast path. I came to know the stretch of the narrow track between Mausel and Namorna, well enough to travel at significant speed over undulating earth and granite rock, even when the light fell and mist or darkness settled in. The path is level from the top of Reginis Hill out to the abandoned Coast Guard station, where a steep descent leads the walker through the former flower meadows down to the granite outcrop known as the Crackers. These granite steps, some massive in size, also built into walls to terrace the meadows, were moved into place with the aid of impressive ingenuity and muscle. I asked my friend and garden mentor, Edgar Wallace, who lived throughout his long life in Mausel, how were your ancestors able to lift and build with stone of such weight? As if the answer was obvious, he replied, they knew how to work in them days. In the clearing by the crackers with the steep meadow, actually, I haven't mentioned that. You, you can't see this, but when you, if you do purchase a book, there are drawings. This one is the kestrel, the, the hawk hovering. The drawings are by our son, Liam. Um, and there's, there's a, a series of drawings in here. Beautiful, beautiful drawings. Thank you to Liam. In the clearing by the crackers where the steep meadows leveled off, I would look up for the hover of a small raptor in the coastal air, a kestrel, as I traversed the coastal ground. This was the bird, if in another incarnation, observed and noted in ecstasy by the poet G.M. Hopkins. Familiar with his poem, The Windhover, long before I settled on the Penwith Peninsula, here I became part of the composition. 
I voiced Hopkins' poem as I leapt from granite rock to rock or stopped to watch the flight of fulmers returning to nest in stone pockets within the cliffs. I remember no separation between a kestrel's wings, my human stride, the mist of Mount's Bay, the face of granite, the words of a Jesuit. And yet, there was a leap of imagination and attention, something wanting a name. How could we be linked in time within a step, a second, a minute, within this particular space? In his ecstasy, the poet takes on the heart of a bird, then off, off, forth on swing as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend. The hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. And the kestrel? Through the rhythmic rush of air on her wings, the beat of her heart, she achieves a metrical dance, one that translates into poetic cadence, the counterpoint of hollow bone, feathers, and currents of air. So that's a bit from, that's a bit from Cornwall. Um, so maybe I am going to read the whole book here. Um, let me have a little drink of water. So I got a chance to um, write about my teacher, uh, Basil Bunting. So the people who know me here have heard his name often, but not many other people probably have. He was a great um, Northumbrian poet, great bard, and um, who knows? how he wound up in Binghamton, New York to teach for a semester. But I was lucky to be there at age 19 or 20. And um, he, there was really, I had never seen anybody like him at all. And um, I've always wanted to write about him. And uh, so there is a chapter um, about Basil Bunting in here. And I wish I could read the whole thing, but I can't. So um, I'm, I'm gonna read you just this last little bit. And it's really because there, are a number of people here uh, familiar with uh, Bill King, William King, who was my uh, uh, stepfather-in-law and married to Connie Fox, Megan's mom, and uh, such a gem of a man. And and I'll I'll tell you when I read this. Anyhow, the the epigraph to this one, the the um, the, the the chapter is called a strong song, which comes from the coda at the end of his great long poem called Brig Flats. Uh, a strong song tows us long, ear sick, blind we follow, rain slant, spray flick to fields we do not know. Uh, shout, ask the sea, what's lost, what's left, what horn sunk, what crown adrift, where we are, who knows of kings, who sup, why, while day fails, who, swinging his ax to fell kings, guesses where we go. So that's Basil Bunting, and, and this is his translation. He's a fascinating man who spent all this time in Persia, and uh, he translated Persian poets, and the, the um, epigraph for a strong song is from a, a great Persian poet named Ferdowsi. I ask the just creator, so much refuge from time that a tale of mine may remain in the world from this famous book of the ancients. And they who speak of such matters weighing their words think of that only when they think of me. That's Ferdowsi, well, Bunting and Ferdowsi. So at the end of this chapter about Bunting, I'm in my study where I spent a lot of time in the, the COVID years writing this book. And um, I say I'm looking at bunting over my shoulder, and it's because Bill's last sculpture was of Basil Bunting. And, and he was, you know, 90. Bill died you know, a few days after his 90th birthday. But I, I went to visit, you know, a couple weeks before that, and, um, and he said there's something out in the deck for you. And it was the sculpture of Basil Bunting, that he had seen the image in the New York Review of Books, and he made this piece about this high. Um, so it's in my study now. So when I say I'm looking at Bunting over my shoulder, that, that's true. 
In my study, placed before two windows that face the rising of the sun above the oaks and pitch pines, and at select times of year, Venus as the morning star, a four-foot-tall wooden sculpture of bunting, inspired by a photograph of a dapper fellow in suit and tie, serious but relaxed, reflective, seated in a wicker chair somewhere in Tenerife, 1930-something. My dear friend and stepfather-in-law, the celebrated one-of-a-kind American sculptor William King found the photo in a book review of A Strong Song Tows Us, The Life of Basil Bunting by Richard Burton. After his 70 years of carving and constructing in every imaginable material, this was Bill's last piece. A few months before he passed away at age 90, and in a tender moment, he revealed this sculpture, his art, as a gift. Bunting has been with me for 50 years in one form or another, and as the stars disperse, a gentle morning light reaches his likeness carved in balsa. By a twist of fate, I've inherited Bill's chisels, tools he cared for and carved with, making audacious art for decades. Now the year ages, in Bunting's words, the choice is obvious, the tool is at hand. I grip a chisel to write. So, as I said, there are these echoes, which, um, and here's one that I skipped over um, that came earlier in the chapter. Uh, in his Northumbrian homeland, Bunting encountered or conjured the right tools to instruct a young writer or reader, a mason's mallet and chisel. This is Bunting. Words, pens are too light. Take a chisel to write. So there's the echo of it. I grip a chisel to write. So that's Bunting. Um, has anybody heard of Basil Bunting? You, of course. <laughs> Amanda heard me, heard me reciting Bunting who knows how many times at the farm. Okay, so I'm gonna read um, uh, from a chapter called The Remembered Earth. And the epigraph to this is from N. Scott Mamaday from his book called The Way to Rainy Mountain. Once in his life, a man ought to concentrate his mind upon the remembered earth, I believe. He ought to give himself up to a particular landscape in his experience, to look at it from as many angles as he can, to wonder about it, to dwell upon it. He ought to imagine that he touches it with his hands at every season, and listens to the sounds that are made upon it. He ought to imagine the creatures there and all the faintest motions of the wind. He ought to recollect the glare of noon and all the colors of the dawn and dusk. So I start with the dusk. Dusk, the swallow's hour, and a bright moon rises in the east over the North Atlantic. The ocean is near, I hear it, just beyond the railroad tracks and Amagantic village, a short glide for an osprey, though I cannot see it from my sheltered garden tucked into the back of a Long Island farm field. I am surrounded on every side by robust maples, white pines, an elegant larch, a thick tangle of bittersweet, honeysuckle, and the rampant porcelain berry. As I kneel on the sweet-smelling earth, planting beans as the light fades, the varieties of Phaseolus vulgaris are rare, collected by seed travelers from distant places, and I am a willing and joyful conservator. New Mexico, Tuscarora bread, raffiofi, purple stardust, Florida June sylvia, shinnecock. As the first star appears below the moon, fireflies rise among the grasses, flickering like earthly stars in familiar terms with the soil. Swallows dip off toward night, and I press the last of the varietals one by one neatly into the row. This silt loam remembers the moment, as do I, as the last of the seeds, nightfall, fills the furrow. Flash! A firefly as the living seed, too, remembers the silt. Now, I didn't make that up. The dusk, it was dusk. I could barely see, and the last seed I was planting happened to be called nightfall. And that's something I love about gardening and working with the earth, is that kind of um, thing happens all the time. <laughs> uh, 
uh, at least in my life it has. So that's, the, that's beginning with dusk. And I'm going to, I think, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to read you this little bit um, because I mentioned the Shinnecock bean. So here's the story of the, of the Shinnecock bean, um, I think. Yeah, yeah. It is autumn, and I am harvesting the seeds of Anna Morena, a plant I am strangely drawn to, despite its far from showy, somewhat odd appearance, and of Scrofularia, figwort, a compact bush that produces tiny red-brown flowers that rival angelica in attracting pollinators, especially bumblebees, five times the size of the flower. For the bee, to gather nectar requires dedication and dexterity of wings and abdomen. There is a radical variation in the task of saving the seeds of these perennial herbs. Anna Morena sends up a thin, tough flower stalk almost four feet, speckled with tiny purple flowers. The seed, slightly larger than a sunflower seed, is encased in a sturdy husk that adheres to the stalk until early winter. The window for harvesting is wide. The seed of scrofularia is tiny, smaller than a grain of mustard seed. And should the husk open and shatter, the gardener has lost the chance. Luckily, this autumn, I am on time, and I seize the day and the seeds to ensure another generation. Although I'm going to pause for a minute to tell you about these seeds of scrofularia, because I love this plant, and I only have one in my Chinese herb garden. And um, they're so tiny. And I, I, for two years in a row, I, I've had great luck in, in germinating the other seeds, but not a single one of these has germinated. But this year, I discovered that they don't like to be, you have to place them right on the surface of the soil and, and mist them. It's a very delicate operation. And so I brought them, I brought, you know, a little tray home. We got them in our window. And uh, luckily, Megan kept up with the, with the spritzing while I was away in Minnesota, and they've germinated. I'm so happy after three years of trying it. <laughs> it's a small miracle. They're about this big right here. I don't know. It's probably going to be a year before I can put them outside. But anyhow, they've germinated. 32 years ago, seated on a 1952 Massey Harris tractor, I seeded a cover crop of rye across this 20-acre farm field to bring it into production. Today, in the herb garden that nests between fields of squash and potatoes, I am harvesting a diversity of seeds, seeds that have served a diversity of cultures. The means of transport and tillage are simplified, and the silt loam soil is improved after decades of regenerative farming practice based on traditional ecological methods. I've improved as a listener as well. The messages are received from maple, larch, Queen Anne's lace, blackberry lily, balloon flower is still blooming, and the southwest west winds are more nuanced and lightly layered. Among the rare beans I harvest now that the dried pods crackle is the cranberry-colored shinnecock bean, a variety above all others that belongs here. Several years ago, at an organic farming conference in Syracuse on the land of the Haudenosaunee, I visited the display table of a champion seed saver, Lisa Bloodnick, known for her generosity and for maintaining a collection of 1,000 bean varieties. This is one woman who keeps these 1,000 bean varieties, including those mentioned at the start of this chapter. I like the look of this one, I said. What is the history? That's the Shinnecock bean, and I was given it by a seed saver from Kentucky, Lisa said. Surprised, engaged, I continued, I'm a neighbor of the Shinnecock Nation. My children attended school with Shinnecock children, and I gardened with a keeper of their seeds. Will you trust me with them? They are yours, said Lisa. I returned to Long Island with a small packet and called Shane at his home on the reservation. His immediate question, are they cranberry colored? Yes. I've heard about those beans, he said, and I have been searching for years. The Shinnecock beans have been on a journey. Lisa was given them by a well-known third-generation seed saver, a Cherokee ethnobotanist from Wildwood Farm in Artemis, Kentucky, Chris Hubbard. The story is this. Chris's grandfather was given beans by a fisherman from Long Island, and their name reports, reports the provenance. Grown out for years at Wildwood Farm and by Lisa at Bloodnick Family Farm in the Susquehanna River Valley and by yours truly, the cranberry beans, after an exodus 
of a hundred years have now returned to their home ground. The variety and coloration reflects the years of travel and the various gardens. The round beans vary from deep cranberry to a light rose to white, artfully streaked with red. Whether grown in Shinnecock soil or in Amagansett silt loam, when I shuck them, the story shimmers out. Rare varieties of beans, a cranberry bean that journeyed forth a century ago from the Shinnecock Reservation and is now rematriated, an indigenous groundnut that twines where it will, Asian plants transplanted to North Atlantic Island soil, a folly, some would say, and I might agree, but a folly that grafts onto the mission of a near neighbor, one that is hopeful, inspiring, risky, exciting, playful, and unexpectedly effective. I recall a passage from Donald Colross Peaty, who said, the fabric is whole and strong, the web is intricate to unravel. We are ourselves part of it. These vital partnerships, these symbioses, are crossed threads in the web that goes back to plant life's beginnings. So um, that was a thrill. A hundred years that bean has been wandering around and now Shane has planted it at the garden. It's a beautiful bean, and I have many of them if anybody wants them. So it ends with, this is the end of the chapter. Dawn, almost, though a waning crescent moon rises in the east, just preceding the sun over the tangled hedge, over the tallest reach of the larch. A sky, an ocean of light like a tide returning. To the south, a thin river of mist caps the newly seeded field of rye. Here in the garden, within the net of moon, ocean, earth, every living thing reflects like a jewel. The auburn tips of Timothy grass, the three-pointed leaves of liquid amber, the red clusters of Sichuan peppers, the vines of Apios Americana intertwined on young conifers, all that is flooded with dew flickers in the early light. There is something in the flight of the sparrowhawk in her quick fall from the hedgerow to a light on silt loam, something familiar, remembered, just so, as daylight fills the furrows. So, I, 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 to be honest, I, um, I felt I, I had to really be there at dawn, and, uh, and I, maybe we camped out a couple times there, but normally I arrived way after dawn. And um, so to finish that chapter, I, I took a tent out there and slept there and awoke at dawn. So, um, so I could say it really looked like this at dawn. Um, okay, so I've been reading for quite a while here. Where do I, where do I go? Um, well, I have to read something about the trees, don't I? I have to read, I, I've got to read something. We've got people here. So trees weave through this whole, but all different kinds of trees. But this one experience, um, there's a number of people in this room uh, who have taken part in. So I'm gonna, um, it's, I'm gonna read from this section and the chapter is called um, Filters of the Earth uh, from there's a wonderful book called the, there's the Man Who Planted Trees. There's two of those, the one by Jean Giannot and another one that celebrates um, uh, the Archangel Ancient Tree Archive. Uh, and that book is called The Man Who Planted Trees as well. And, and uh, this is from the Giannot book. But now all was changed, even the air. Instead of the rough and arid gusts that I had met with before, there was a soft and scented breeze, a sound like water drifted down from the heights. It was the wind in the forests. And this is from Gaston Bachelard from the Poetics of Space. For the world is a nest, and an immense power holds the inhabitants of the world in this nest. Really beautiful book, The Poetics of Space. The trees arrived today, three boxes shipped from Copamish, Michigan, each box a nest for 11 trees, and on each container pot a label, Sequoia Sempervirens, Hardy East Coast Redwoods. When we opened each box, what a wonder, slender redwood saplings three and a half feet in length nestled together, each main spine taped to a bamboo stake 
Short needle-like leaves are shining green, even after the significant journey. Perhaps because this project is quite unique, these baby redwoods seem to embody the charisma of their California relatives. They are ready to be planted, and we've prepared the site in Bridgehampton on the campus of the Hayground School. The children, too, are ready to plant, and several young students have met the mother trees. Megan and I received a call from David Millark, founder of the Archangel Ancient Tree Archive in late winter. We had met a couple of times in the past, and he voiced a request. I'm sitting here in my greenhouse in Copamish, surrounded by about 100 hardy Long Island redwood clones, and we would really like to send them home. Copamish is the home, boat, home base for Archangel, and the place where cuttings of champion trees are cloned through an intricate horticultural process, monitored, nurtured, and grown to sapling stage in greenhouses. Our reply was immediate, and we would like to welcome them. Okay, so I'm going to skip a bit here, but um, these, these were uh, saplings that had been grown out for three years in Copamish, and they were, um, they were taken from the trees at Longhouse Reserve. Hardly anyone knows that these redwoods exist, um, but now more people know about them. They've been there for 25 to 30 years, and we know that they came from Rockefeller Center, from the great horticulturalists there. That's about all we know. We figured out any more than that. And um, when David Millark came to visit and Charlie Martyr took him around, um, he said, no, there can't be, there can't be coastal redwoods growing here. They, they're, they're not hardy enough. Well, they are. And so David took these cuttings and took them back, grew them out for three years, and he sent them to us and they're planted at hay ground now. And um, most of them are looking spectacular after the first winter. Um, so we'll see what happens. The ones at the ones at Longhouse um, are probably about 50 feet tall, maybe 55, maybe 60 feet tall, and um, who knows how? They're not going to get to be 380 feet tall, is the the height that they grow in California. But they're really beautiful trees. So um, I urge you to to see them. And there are more, <laughs> as a matter of fact. So um, we have is John here? Oh, my Redwood brother, Megan and, Megan and John Snow and I have spent a lot of time with those Redwoods. <laughs> um, okay, so, so this is the end of that, of that chapter. Before the saplings arrived from Copamish, we visited the home of the mother trees at Longhouse Reserve with several children to introduce them to the story. My son, a cinematographer, filmed the graceful sequoias and the equally graceful children. Seven-year-old Indy, he's a martyr, son of, son of Micah. Seven-year-old Indy, his hands in a tall redwood, said this, because of climate change, the trees are dying, and if there's no trees, there's no oxygen, and if there's no oxygen, there's going to be no people. Indy said that, seven years old. At hay ground, we laid out a serpentine pattern that winds through the former potato field and arrives at a circle, a place to gather a future grove. We envision that one day classes will be held there under a canopy of redwood leaves and branches, and someone may remember the poetic thought that began this book of Rabin Abindranath Tagore concerning instructor and students. Of your two teachers, you will gain more wisdom from the trees. But today, in lieu of a class, a celebration. The newly planted saplings encircle an entire school of children, teachers, former students, gardeners, the longhouse horticulturalists, sequoia lovers. Seated in the center of the circle, Becky Genia, a respected elder from the Shinnecock Nation, speaks and sings. Her words are reverent and instructive and loving towards the children. Her blessing is named the Corn Dance Song, an eight-year-old Lucia times her rattle perfectly to Becky's drum. Calmly, one child after another speaks of this other species that we need to nurture. Within the circle, as we nest together, we place ourselves at the origin of confidence in the world. The song lingers long in the air. We return to planting saplings, and a five-year-old child, her hands immersed in soil and roots, responds easily to Megan's question. What do you hear the trees saying? Her answer, thank you for planting us. 
So, okay, getting near the end. I opened the page to the epilogue, so, so we're nearing the end here. Um, this is the epilogue. It's called A Flash of Beauty. There's an epigraph from William Blake. The bird, a nest. The spider, a web. Man, friendship. May has arrived, and I'm turning ground in the herb garden with a long-handled shovel as I was taught on the coastal fields of Cornwall by my meadow mentor, Edgar Wallace. Turn him over rough, he would say, and his delivery matched the expression perfectly. Let the wind and rain loosen him. That way I learned the art of shovel and spade in the hedge school, if you will, a method to prepare the ground for planting, focused on the immediate task while learning to read the soil. Now here in the herb garden on this other peninsula, the steel share of the shovel after the spring rains cuts through clay like butter. I turn it over rough and throw the loam forward, stepping back, lifting the ash handle with my thigh just above the knee. I stop to sip the spirit of the place. I can taste it, and words rise up out of the soil. This landscape is crisp within earth's spin. I am surrounded by the white pines, maples, locusts, the one cherry, and the one larch I now know so well. I've planted some trees here in this garden, part of the project known as Zhejiang herbs, which means regeneration, to learn more about the medicinal qualities of mimosa, arborvitae, eucomia, liquid amber, and Sichuan pepper. In the adjacent fields to the north and south, a young crew of community farmers cultivate potatoes, garlic, and greens as they learn to recognize true fertility in a field and what it means to labor within the cycle that Sir Albert Howard, drawing on Eastern religions, names the wheel of life. Swallows turn and wheel in their dance of feeding, their cream breasts a flash of beauty against the blue. Their flight is an art that livens the air, the space between Earth and the distant reach of the cosmos. John Hay, after writing masterfully about nature for many years, revealed that he did not know what it meant. After decades of fostering a daily conversation with the natural world, I am in sympathy with Hay, but if a gesture of nature can translate what cannot be said, I have seen it as in one past spring when the handsome tulip tree growing in place for 25 years in the field we call Birch Hill burst into abundant flower for the first time. My aspiration is to follow the model of the many-voiced Portuguese poet Fernando Pessoa, who wrote, I don't know what nature is, I sing it. So I'm going to go to the very end of the epilogue. And um, with, a, with a thank you to, so much goes into the making of a book and so many people. I just, I'm, I'm so thankful to all of those who, who have, are part of this book. Um, and, you know, Milkweed is the, the perfect place for it. And um, thanks to Paul Bresnik in the back. And thank you to Megan. <laughs> In the center of the herb plantings, a golden garden spider, also known as the writing spider, has built a web among the lively branching Forsythia suspensa after the delicate yellow flowers fell to earth. I wonder at the resilience of the spider's delicate thread that vibrates with the wind and flashes in the sunlight between seen and unseen, a thread almost without weight, spun out from a nearly weightless orb weaving arachnid, yet strong enough to span the distance between forsythia branch and oak stake. This thin substance pulses with the basic energy of the universe, an energy fragile when displaced, though intricate in evolution and architecture, like words, made to ride changes in weather. For the indigenous people of this land, language, words exist as primal creative powers behind all things manifest. 
behind the spider, the forsythia branch, the light that plays on the gossamer thread. We are invited to listen, to receive the music, to make it new, and to harmonize. No word exists alone. Here in the garden, language is alive within the web of ocean mist, fluent wind and pollinators returning to brush the flowers of May. And my choice again is obvious. I grip the ash handle to turn silt and clay, and daylight fills the furrows. Under the soil, under the eternal flux, the rhizome endures. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Scott. It's beautiful. Are there any questions? Please, don't be shy. There must be a question. One question. I'm very intrigued. What drew you to Cornwall in the first place? Oh my gosh! Do you have another half an hour? <laughs> Megan, uh, briefly. Megan wrote a book um, when she was 12 years old to a woman. Hmm? She read a book. You didn't, yeah, write it. She read a book. And when she was 12 years old, called, um, the, um, it's not the answer to the cry. Cry of a bird. The cry of a bird. Cry of a bird by Dorothy Iglesias. And um, they exchanged letters. Megan was 12 or 13, and Dorothy was in her 80s. They exchanged letters for about 15 years. And, and Megan and I had both studied. We met in England. We both studied uh, through Antioch. College Center for British Studies, and, and, and we came back to the country and we wanted to return, and when we returned, um, we were led, how about, the, I always get this part of the story wrong. Anyhow, we were led to Cornwall, to the, the houses where Dorothy and her sister Pog lived for 50 years and took care of birds. Um, they were amazing, the two of them, and Pog was a wood sculptor, and the, the two of them, um, lived and cared for birds and and Megan's letters were all in a in a uh, there in the cottage when when we were there all wrapped separately from all the other letters that Dorothy had gotten and we wound up living there for eight years yeah yeah it's a great question any other questions Danielle hi Danielle. hi Scott so <laughs> nice to be here um, you talk a little bit about your relationship with the Shinnecock Nation. I know you've spent time in New Mexico and other parts of the world. Tell us about your connection working with indigenous people in the land and what you've learned from them, the connections. Well, um, the, my first connection with Shinnecock was through the, the land trust. You know, the, I worked for Peconic Land Trust for 30 years. And... Um, uh, I can't remember how it, how it came about, but but we were approached. Um, uh, oh gosh, why am I? Why was the name escaping me? Monty, yeah, with, with Monty um, Lamont Smith um, was the gardener. He was the gardener at Shinnecock. He was the keeper of the seeds, and and we helped him create a garden uh, um, at. Uh, Mary Ryan's. I forgot all about this. We've had some discussion about this recently. So out at the end of uh, Springs Fireplace Road. And so M Monty and I worked on that garden for a couple years. And um, unfortunately, Monty passed away. But that actually led to, I learned a lot from him, obviously, but that led, to, especially planting of the corn. So he waited to plant the corn in hills before uh, the running of the first um, fish. Uh, uh, now I'm forgetting that too. Uh, the alewife. Uh, of course, the alewife. Running of that and then he would put, he would actually put the whole fish in the hill um, and he didn't, you know, the fish just went in there and then the, built a little hill and then the corn on top of it. So it was an amazing thing to be part of. Um, and um, so this is a new connection now with Shane. You know, Monty's gone and we actually through the, through the land trust, we were involved in an amazing project of uh, creating gardens in 10 different locations uh, of lower income places on Long Island and Suffolk County. It was an amazing um, 
chapter that took up about four years, and one of those gardens was on Shinnecock. And so that was another time spent there. And the latest with the connection with the Shinnecock is that when David Millark was here from, uh, from Michigan, um, he, he, his, he requested right away. He said, if I'm coming there, I want to go to the reservation. So we took him there. And, and after he went back to Michigan, he sent uh, 100 black willows that um, are now I think maybe there's 12 left or something. The rest of them are, are planted there at the Shinnecock Reservation. And they're a, a, they're a healing tree. They're, they're meant to be planted near waterways, any, any waterways. Um, so I don't know, that's, I mean, there is another chapter um, in here about um, uh, meeting uh, a, uh, with people through an organization called Garden's Edge in New Mexico. And we took part in this amazing uh, ceremony, I, I think I'll call it, of harvesting amaranth seeds. Um, and, uh, and we learned about what Garden's Edge was doing um, with uh, connecting indigenous tribes. And it was an amazing experience. So there's a whole chapter actually about that in here. Yeah, I hope there's m many more chances to learn from indigenous people. Yeah. April? Thank, thank you, by the way, for oh, being here at the church. This is so wonderful, Scott. <laughs> I can't tell you. It's, it's, <laughs> it's so inspiring. And I, I love the fact that you seem unable to speak about nature without poetry and poetry without <laughs> nature. It's such a great symbiosis in your, in your life and your presentation. Um, on a more practical just question, um, do you try to eat only what you grow? Uh, well, yeah, I think as far as, you know, c compared to what most people eat, I think we've done pretty good over the years. Uh, but now I'm really just picking because, you know, I have my little garden at the back of Quail Hill, and they, uh, they act, when they plant things near that, they call it Scott's Picking Garden so that I can go and harvest. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and then there's all the other things that as vegetarians we need, like tofu and tempeh and all that kind of stuff, right? But, yeah, for all these years, for... 30, well, we didn't, we grew it in Cornwall too, so I guess it'd go back about 40 years we've been growing most of our food, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I think you, I, I live near Scott and kind of, kind of have the same circumstances. We're in the woods, the soil's, we, no soil, it's sand. Um, what I've done. I work at a winery, so I've been taking half barrels and making, I have a barrel of peas and a barrel of spinach and lettuce, flowers. I have a, um, a, a John Little quince tree that big. And um, you, you've inspired me. I was wondering what you did. You go back to Quail Hill to, because it's, it's kind of limited, because you're limited in light. Oh, where we are? Yeah. Well, you're brave. I'm uh, to try yeah. and grow anything. Well, it's amazing. The tr the I mean, I'm the only one. I th one of the few people legitimately you're supposed to leave 30 percent untouched. So, which I have, but yeah. not around me. Yeah. Uh, so I can't. I mean, we have more oxygen. I have more trees, right? I suppose that's true. Mm -hmm. um, we also have sand. I, I wouldn't sand. call it soil, and we have an overabundance of trees, which I'm thankful for. So yeah. ha happily, things are being grown at Quail Hill, and I can yeah. harvest there instead of growing on growing where we live. Yeah. Well, I, I bought your book, The White's Farm is being farmed by various people these days, but Brian, my son-in-law, has taken a, a little corner. He's biochemistry from Stony Brook, and he mm. is, he likes to graft and root and He's going to town. He's got fig trees and right. all different kinds of peaches on the peach tree and, yeah. and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and he's put in flowers. He loves cucumbers and it's deer fence already. So I'm deer fence now. So that's otherwise I wouldn't even try. That's but I, great. I was just wondering what kind of gardening. And when you told me it's a quail hell, yeah. that's the spot. Yeah. But if, I'm trying to be adaptive. Well, you're doing your brave. You're doing a great job. Yeah, well, 
Keep keep at it. I think it. I'm going to add some more barrels because the soil. <laughs> there's no point, and you know you can't really. You have to just mate your soil. When I um, moved here permanently, I of course had sand, <laughs> and so um, I can't live without gardening. So um, I was wondering why there's not more movement and education for people here to compost. Mm. So um, I, what I had to do was build the garden up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I made a wall mm -hmm. and filled it with mm -hmm. compost mm -hmm. and, make, and continuously make compost, which is free yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. easy. Mm -hmm. And um, so I can continue to grow the food that I yeah. eat. Yeah. But um, you can do that here in Sag Harbor, yeah. As long as you have a little bit of topsoil and a whole lot of compost, yeah. And um, there's really nothing like eating the food you grow, yeah. Um, spiritually and nutritionally. <laughs> yeah, I'm all for it. So um, you can do it, but I mean, it's too bad that everybody doesn't have a little corner of the yard for composting, yeah. Even if it's for flowers, you know. Yeah. Well, whatever. Maybe you're going to start something here. Right? Right. <laughs> no, you're going to start it. <laughs> I don't know. For about 20 years, I traveled all over the place, um, you know, teaching people about composting and everything. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's the, one of the best things, right? Yeah. I don't think so. They 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 have wood chip compost, but it's not really. Yes. Yeah, right. I didn't approve of their compost. Yeah, yeah. I felt the same way. Yeah, anyhow. Keep eating a lot of vegetables. You have more and more compost, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Right, yeah. grow so much food mm. um, right in Bridgehampton. Yeah. And so it's been years of cultivating, nourishing, and composting. Yeah. But you can grow so much food in a small in piece of land. In a small place, yeah. yeah. It's amazing, yeah. Uh, before the Second World War, you know, right about the time uh, everyone, you know, was told to plant gardens and 70% of the uh, vegetable food grown in this country we're in in small gardens yeah it can be done yeah thank you scott thank you. uh do we have any more questions april has one last question i just i know this sounds like a really wacky idea but you know how in english country estates in the 1700s and 1800s it was popular to have a hermit living on your land. I mean, people actually liked this whole idea of, I mean, relics were supposed to have been for, you know, pilgrims or whatever. It was, it was a kind of a thing. Mm. And I wonder if we could like get people who have big estates in Wayne Scott and Watermill and Sagaponic and stuff to like turn over a little corner of their land, maybe to children, maybe just to people who live in Sag Harbor who mm. don't have great alluvial soil like they've mm. been gifted and do you think that would be in any way possible or imaginable you seem like just the person to lead the charge for that <laughs> i think you're the right person <laughs> you could do it <laughs> i'll help <laughs> yeah it would be amazing yeah yeah Okay, well then, about the about the two of us, we'll, we're we're going to talk. <laughs> Scott, Th thank you thank so you much. Thank you for being here.